All right, another video. So, um, since the last one that I made, it has been um, Shabbat. Hold on, I'm gonna close my door. Uh, um, so yes, Shabbat has happened, and um, it was really nice. It was really personal, and everybody was all together, like, the whole time. Um, we started off by um, finishing, oh yeah, we didn't have class on Friday, so actually I went to the Shuk that day with, um, Hana, Esti, and Miriam, who are, um, three girls who are, like, raised observant, so they, like, know a lot about what's going on, they've lived in Israel for, like, long stretches of time. Hana actually did, like, or was it one, or did she do all of her years of seminary here. I think she may have done like all of high school and then one more year here. So um, she knows Hebrew really well, um, as does Miriam, as does SD, which I'm quite envious of. It's awesome. They speak so well. Um, but um, it was fun to go out with them and see the Shook and I haven't been there in a while. The Shook in Jerusalem is like really hectic and crazy, especially on Fridays because um, it's when everybody's getting ready for Shabbat. So we have to buy all the desserts and well, we were buying stuff for Farbregen, which is um, the time when everybody can just sit around and like talk and be themselves and it's not about like lessons or learning or um writing anything down or whatever it's really just like being all together and um it's like a, it's meant to be like a feminine aspect of uh, of, of judaism um so that was like fun it was a little bit aggravating <laughs> being in the shuk and like dealing with israelis and arabs that i haven't like been around in so long like People here are super pushy and you have to just be up for it um, or it can be frustrating. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Yeah, we, we still had a nice time though and um, got like lots of fresh fruit and um, dried fruit. You just like can take a piece of fruit or nut from like whatever. Uh, they give you a lot of samples from like the stands there. So... And just take whatever you want and then um, tell them how many shekels worth you want or how many like pounds or handfuls or whatever. Literally, it's so loose, but it's really nice. Um, and if you speak Hebrew, they usually give you stuff cheaper. And um, I got good at that last time I was here, but I haven't used Hebrew in so long. I can't really communicate like I did before. Um, any case, um, so... That was that was in the daytime because we don't have class Fridays, and then um, in the evening we got back and everybody showered and um, prepared Shabbos dinner. We were here alone the entire day. We had no staff. It was just the girls getting ready for dinner, and um, I made like two salads and um, helped with stuff in the kitchen and. Um, so there's actually this whole thing about separating meat and dairy in um, Judaism because it's considered, if you eat them together, bathing a baby in its mother's milk, which seems really morbid and graphic, but um, that's because, honestly, I think it kind of is. And, I mean, although I'm vegan and I, like, don't really participate in consuming animal products at all, um, I think that, like, these rules of kashrut do, like, you know, a, a more just job of it than um, many other practices or no practices. I don't really know of many others other than, like, organic, um, like, open field grazing and stuff like that, um, you know, like, ethical farming that exists. Although... I, I do still take some issue with some of the kosher ways of being, I think, like, the mass production and stuff. I talked about this in the past video. Anyhow, so we have separate meat and milk um, kitchens, and most of the week you don't eat meat. You just eat, you can eat other things, but um, not meat, maybe fish, but usually not so much meat, maybe only for dinner. You have dairy, like, in the beginning of the day, and you have meat, like, at the end of the day, because... 
of the rules of like how many hours you have to wait after eating one to digest it. Like it takes three hours to digest meat, it takes an hour two to digest dairy. So, um, and these are like really old laws. So it's really interesting that they exist and like before the research was even done concluding that like it takes this many hours to digest such and such amount of meat or whatever. So um, I think it's cool. There's something to it. Um, and then, so yeah, we were using the meat kitchen, um, and I, I made all the food, and then we showered, and we went downstairs for dinner, and, oh, no, actually, we lit candles, which, like, one of the, pre one of the mitzvot of a woman, um, especially on Shabbos, I think it's, it's candle lighting, making challah, and... Um, probably keeping the Shabbos. I can't remember. I think a uh, mikvah. Those are the three like main uh, mitzvot of like uh, a woman in in Judaism, um, and they're really special because like mikvah has to do with like um, returning to the womb and like feeling this like nurturing like presence of God, and then like you come out and you're like it's kind of like where the idea of baptism came from. Really, actually, it's like um, it's like a rebirth. Um, sort of idea. So, um, anyhow, so there's that, and then we made challah, and um, what everybody does, though, is um, always light candles. All the guests will light candles if they're in a house where they didn't make the challah. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was nice we did that, and then we walked to the hotel, and uh, there... We all, actually, we all kind of split up <laughs> once we got there, um, and I got back together at the end, but it was so packed, like, I think it was maybe even abnormal for the hotel to be so packed, um, the Western Wall to be so, like, full of people on even any normal Shabbos, um, I think just because of, like, what's been going on, and that people feel they need to daven, pray extra, um, and, like, really have that good intention of like bringing home our soldiers and like having peace in Palestine and um I don't know I I pray for that as much as I pray for um the good things for Israel I pray for the bad things to stop the good things to come um because I think it's not fair to ignore one side's struggle we've talked about this too before so um, anyhow, we got back 9.30, we started our dinner finally. It might have even been later, I don't know, it was insane. Um, and my friend was emceeing, which was totally hilarious, but, um, really entertaining. And we had a lot of fun, like, we just sat around talking all night, um, went over, um, the Parsha, um, which was, like, after Moses has, um, brought the people to Sinai, I guess it was after that, because when he came down and split the rock was my, my Torah portion of my bat mitzvah, which was actually um, seven tamas, which was the week before this past Shabbos. Um, and this one was about um, the men of Moaz um, being um, seducted, seduced by um, the, or no, well, it was the men, the sons of, um, I don't know where I wrote it. In any case, there were Jewish men who were being, um, seduced by the, oh, here, it was Numbers, um, Book of Moshe, um, obviously, um, uh, let's see. No, I didn't write it exactly what it was. So, well, I have a number of things that I want to talk about, so I'm going to get this out of the way, and I'll make a different video for the other one, because it was before that on Thursday that we had this other talk. Um, so, this was about um, the king of Moaz t bringing um, Moab, why am I saying Moaz, Moab, um, bringing uh, his daughters to seduce these men so that they wouldn't be holy, and it was this whole issue, um, and interesting because um, it was all about, like, 
bringing people back to like their nature and um, like refuting evil intentions and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, we talked about the the Torah portion a lot. It, it often gets really reiterated a lot around Shabbat. Um, but what was really fun and like really the most special was about all of us being together. Um, at the end of dinner, we have Fabregan, which is like the time when we all just sit together in being, which I talked about before, being like the feminine aspect of um, like Judaism or a feminine aspect of um, just like simply being as opposed to like going out and doing something and like, you know, facing things head on in such a way. Um, so uh, that was really fun. And the, the, the aim of it was to have us um, all tell about our upbringing and how we got to my note. So um, there were a handful of girls that were um, like in the process of becoming religious. We have two girls who are converting. Um, and it's really amazing the whole idea and the whole um, like their stories about like what it's like and how they've felt about things. Um, and so it's been really cool um, talking to them. But um, just hearing everyone's stories, like, you know, what their parents are like. We have, like, five girls that are either in or just um, have been finishing up dental school for some reason, being a dentist assistant, and, like, actually five or six out of, like, 20 of us. Actually, it's maybe 25 or 30, but still, that's, like, an abnormal, like, amount of people who are in dentistry or have been. Uh, anyhow... Then, uh, yeah, we all sat around talking and eating, and it, it took until, like, 3 o'clock in the morning before the rabbi was like, okay, this is taking a really long time. We should just finish tomorrow. Um, so we finished that on Saturday. Um, and it's really amazing. Hearing each person's story really teaches you not to judge anyone. Ultimately, you realize that everybody has their own path, their own story, um, their own way of coping and like dealing with things and of like getting through like each section of their journey and um it doesn't warrant judgment because they are only as far as they can go with what they know and um so there's like a certain respect I have for everyone and um what they've done the choices they've made and coming here you know just being here we all have like the commonality of looking for something deeper and like really seeking um, a certain morality and, you know, having an ethical code sort of, um, like, blueprint to live by. Um, and I really like that. Today we actually had a talk about how basically you're not supposed to, like, teach Torah, like, stringently. Everybody has to do the same thing. It's like you have to teach a child in his way so that he'll relate to it. And then eventually, even though his relation to it is not ultimate truth, because Torah is ultimate truth, you know, in the opinion of, like, this rabbi, rabbis and stuff, um, it's that, like, you go through life, if even if somebody teaches you, like, an ultimate truth when you're so young, you're not going to take it in. You have to, like, go... Uh, learning your own lessons. So that's what the idea was, that you have to really experience something for yourself and um, have paradigm shifts. And the teacher is actually using these words, you know, um, you know, change paradigms or paradigm shift is where an idea that you have, um, like a, a chunk of a worldview, like a big idea, um, like a, a, a belief, really, um, a part of a belief system, um, and the shift is when you drop what you believed and you pick up something new, and um, there was this whole idea about, well, can you just pick up the new one and still hold on to the old one, you know, is there some, how do you transition, you know, what is the deal with this, and really the idea was that um, while you still have the knowledge and the understanding of the paradigm that you had before, you come to the table now with, um, for a little bit, you, you become kind of vulnerable and that you don't have any belief between that and picking up your new belief. So I don't know what I think of that. It's interesting. Personally, I feel like when I have big, like, sh shifts in, like, my ideals or my ideologies, it sort of, like, 
it pushes out a part of a paradigm that I was like aware of and replaces maybe like an aspect of it so that there's like a new slant on it. Um, kind of like what my ideas about like the Arab and Israeli conflict has been like um, and you know slowly moving toward not a neutral state but um, a more compassionate one. So um, in any case I I enjoyed that. That was class earlier today. The rest of Shabbos, though, was um, Saturday. We were all slept in really late because we had been made to stay up so late. Um, and got up then in the morning and had, um, well, in the afternoon, actually. I think that, like, most people didn't come um, to lunch until, like, 2 or 2.30 or something. We were all finally up. Like, nobody was up with, like, morning davening or, like, um, really anything. Oh, I'm tired right now. But, um, so, um, we were all together for that and, um, finished our stories and, um, then... Oh, I'm just trying to decide what to really talk about because I'm getting into almost the 20 minute range but um so after that a bunch of us went um when we finished meals and for bragging um actually just after that ended we heard a siren and i was actually just walking out of the bait midrash which is like basically the center for learning um actually midrash midrash is like something else um it's more like um it's not one-on-one -on -one learning, that's something else that we just did actually, which is really nice. One-on-one -on -one learning with like a person you just sit down and read a book and um, you know, I was reading about like prayer, a book on like um, the the rules about prayer and then you open a siddur and you read the prayer and you read how you're supposed to do it, um, what the halacha is, the Jewish law associated with it, which um, is actually like exactly the thing that I've been like really yearning to um to start getting into. So I was really glad that um the girl who was left without a partner to to learn with I um I got to I got to sit with her and work on the blood and um yeah and halakha. So <sighs> um, so yeah, anyways, I was like just walking out of the Beit Midrash and, um, and heard this siren and all of these other girls were like jabbering, they're talking to each other, all really excited and they weren't getting, they didn't hear it. Like, I realized they couldn't hear it, like, um, over themselves and also maybe because of that room, I don't know. But, um, I poked my head back into the room and I said, guys, there's a siren and they all came running and we all came inside and up into the second floor, not the third, because, um, if a missile comes through the roof, um, you're in bad shape. But if it, when it does, like you can really only go through one floor, like it's, it's going to get through like an exterior wall or a ceiling. It's not going to get like through the next level down or anything like that. Um, they're they're actually pretty big i think i mentioned before but they're not so strong then they're not explosive so um anyhow we all came in here and um the rabbi's son was like making siren noises and we were like trying to listen to hear and you're supposed to you know try to pay attention so you know if um how many explosions there have been um especially on shabbos it's hard to tell because we didn't have our phones with red alert which is the um the app that we use to know um where um where palestinians are throwing missiles um one got all the way up to haifa today which like is really unusual and rare and we thought that it may have come from um Lebanon because they had apparently started throwing missiles too like there was one in Haifa a couple of days ago but um I think I think it was actually from Gaza which is like really weird and crazy because that's totally unusual apparently they heard it all the way in Netanya which is like just north well it's, it's a couple cities north of Tel Aviv um but Haifa is like way further north it's, it was just like really surprising and strange um on the on the coast so um, 
so yeah, we all came in here and took cover for a little while, and we were like all just about to go out for a walk, a bunch of us. Um, so after that, we went for the walk, <laughs> um, and it was really surprising. It was amazing because you know you would think right after there's been a siren, like everybody is going to stay in their house now. You know, like no one wants to go out when they know that rockets are being fired into the country, but. Um, Instead, there were lots of people outside, like so many, and it just gives you so much hope. And like, it's so beautiful that people are determined to keep living their lives despite whatever, you know, um, threats befall us. People are going to keep living because you can't just live in fear. Um, and I think that's cool, and I, I like living by that. It's um, a little bit like living on the edge, but it's also really just like making it normal and, and going with it and, and living. Um, so we walked along um, up through our neighborhood. Um, I guess we're in Jerusalem. So, oh yeah, wait, we were walking east towards um, the West Bank, um, but not like close to it. Um, I mean, we're reasonably close to the West Bank just because we're in Jerusalem but um we walked um on this thing called the boardwalk and there's like this big area with like all these open kind of like canopy looking things and like stairs going down with like platforms and you can walk across at like any level um it's just like an area to go walking and it has like because what is below is like this big, huge, beautiful view of the whole city of Jerusalem, like everything else. And like the old city was um, out to mm, the south, I guess, from like where we were. Um, or would that be the north? Maybe? Yeah, to the north. Um, and we were a little further like southwest of it, um, of, like, Jerusalem than it is, rather. Hello. Um, computer turned itself off for a second. Um, so we were sitting and, like, watching the sunset, and, which is really beautiful, and, um, it's just so amazing to look out and see all of these homes, and, like, the first, like, big chunk you see on this hill, like, before the, um, the Kotel and the Dome of the Rock is all Jewish, and you can tell because Jewish homes have, um, white water heaters on them, um, and, or water tanks or whatever, and the, um, Arab homes have black water heaters, so, um, you can always tell what kind of neighborhood you're in, and also by, like, if houses are, like, really kind of just dispersed on a hill that's just sort of like the Arab way of like living it's like just how their communities are and um the Israelis I guess are like a, more neurotic and a little bit more uh organized so um so we were like looking out uh to the to the south and where you could see the border um with the wall um which saves has saved thousands of lives like it's completely um it's necessary and i don't really appreciate people who take it out of context and they're like oh it's an apartheid wall it's holding people back from moving freely i mean there are people even jews okay yeah it's like apparently some of them it's illegal that they live in settlements on the other side but they have to go the whole way through a checkpoint around to go to their neighbor's house to like just go see their friends so um, you know, it's, it's not easy for anybody who lives around that area, but, um, anyhow, they, we were, uh, looking, you know, trying to see where the cutoff was and, like, where it goes and talking about some of the things around that area, and, um, you know, I looked out to the north for a moment, and as I was turning my head back, I kind of saw something out of the corner of my eye, and I shot my head back to look, like, what was that? Because I saw something shoot up out of the earth and then boom when I had when I looked back what I saw was just smoke and the Iron Dome had just blown up another missile and for it to be the second time that I see the smoke of a missile getting blown up is like really rare most people don't see like a missile get blown up because when you hear a siren you run inside and um we were in a place where you could see so much of Jerusalem, though, that it was a neighborhood so far away that we didn't get a siren in our neighborhood. It was their neighborhood would have a siren. Um, and it was one that was, like, really creepishly close to the hotel, which, like, I mean, <laughs> if you want to blow stuff up and, like, you're going to be doing that, then 
you're getting really close to your own people, like on the other side of Palestine. So I don't know. I, I guess they just um, it's that's the the cost to Gazans to kill Jews because that's what the point of they're throwing missiles in. So it's not defensive because they're not blowing up bombs with their missiles. They're just trying to kill people. Um, whereas um, Jewish bombs, well, the bombs coming from Israel from the IDF are like sent to go explode where there are weapons being kept, which is usually in houses, mosques, other public places, um, even hospitals and schools. So, um, yeah, it's no good the way that is. But the IDF takes planes and they, uh, like throw down, um, leaflets papers saying when and where they're gonna bomb because they know that there are weapons there and um, for everybody to evacuate like in right now just today there was this thing circulating about the leaflets to show what they write um, and about how they were doing it in um, northern Gaza and you know it was just like an example if Hamas is gonna like do that and use people's homes as like their breeding grounds for weaponry. Um, that's why there's such a high death toll there. And Hamas tells them not to leave. Hamas tells them to stay so that they can have a higher death rate and say, oh, look what Israel did. And it's really nasty. Like, the Palestinians don't want to die. They're not making themselves human shields, most of them. But there is a large faction. There's just a big, like, culture there of, of doing that. And, um, especially among Hamas and their followers, which is, like, really bad. Um, and I'm so sorry for the people who live there that have to be victim to their own government. It's, like, really bad and nasty. Um, so anyhow, I was just, like, really shocked again. We saw, like, something had blown out of the sky. It's, like, but it's also at the same time, it's so miraculous. You have this, like, feeling, this, like, tingling madness come through your body, and you're just, like, in awe of how protected we feel and um that's really special and and i really feel a lot of gratitude for the idea for um doing what they do and um and for a lot of them now speaking up too there's this movement happening apparently um or at least the website that's open um i think it's called break the silence about um, some of the really unethical things that they have to do, like go occupy homes in West Bank while they um, like hide out before carrying out a mission. Um, and, you know, because they have to stay there and like maybe watch somebody who they think is a terrorist, but they like take over this person's house for like a couple of days and displace the family um, while they like use it as a shelter or even. Um, and if they fire from it, the house is going to get fired back at. So it's like, it's messy business. And sometimes it's like more or less what they have to do because somebody's making a plan for it, some kind of attack. And like, I'm sure we could not count how many lives are saved by those kinds of things. But at the same time, they're, they're killing other people. So I don't know. It's, it's twisted and messy, but they're protecting their own people, which ultimately I can't disagree with. Um, but the way that it's done is like, if they could clean it up a little bit, or a lot, um, it would be a lot better. Um, so, yeah, I've been talking to a lot of people about this um, on Facebook and online, and um, reading a lot of articles now, I'm really trying to get myself educated and involved because I don't want to have a one-sided or, you know, undereducated, un uninformed um, opinion or, you know, uh, perspective on this. It's, I think it's really important um, not just to, to be passionate, but to be um, truthful and to be as honest with oneself as possible. So um, that's where I lie with things lately. Um, I'm going to do another video right now on the lesson that we had the other day about, it was all about, um, oh, what's it called? Um, I want to find the word because it's really awesome. I'll mention it in the other video too, but, uh, um, people say HP, which is divine providence. 
from a really beautiful concept and uh, just from the stories that all the girls told this weekend. <laughs> so much miraculous stuff. Like opening a book and finding the word. One, one girl, her mom um, was helping her decide what to do. I think it was after she had gone out of dental school. And her mom opened uh, this book that's basically like all about like advice. And you find like your page that like based on like a bunch of different stuff. And you choose the page that you're going to read. And the one that she opened said my note like over and over and over. It's not a common word and it's like not a word that like was on a bunch of pages in this book. It just so happened that like she got this message that um, had come to my note. So um, I think that's really powerful and incredible. So yeah, all right, that is all for now. I will see you all soon.